Just the most famous slurry wall is the slurry wall constructed around the World Trade Center. This was done in the late 1960s. There were some real challenges to be overcome. First of all, it's a very large site. It's a very deep excavation. The excavation takes place immediately adjacent to the Hudson River, and so it is uh, almost entirely below the water table. There are adjoining highways, there are adjoining buildings. The solution that was chosen was to construct slurry walls around the perimeter of the site, and it seems to have been an excellent choice and the slurry walls have served very, very well. Here you can get a glimpse of the uh, original slurry wall. And here's a, a better look at uh, this wall because the uh, sun is shining on it. And you can see this wall, this is the north wall of the excavation, is uh, immediately adjacent to a very tall building that's not a conventional building. That building is actually filled with uh, switch gear for telephone service throughout uh, Manhattan. There are some other interesting features here. This is the old West Side Highway. I guess you have to be a certain age to remember the West Side Highway. It was an elevated highway. It ran around the lower part of Manhattan very very effective way to get around. It collapsed through uh, sheer neglect. The structure was never maintained. It was never painted. It finally gave way entirely and a truck fell through the roadway. Now you would have thought that would lead to an immediate design of a new facility but actually it took decades before the the old West Side Highway was completely rebuilt. It's rebuilt now at grade, so it has traffic signals and it's really not the same as having the old elevated highway. One portion of the highway still has not been rebuilt. It would have been rebuilt, but 9-11 came along and disrupted that. It is now under construction. This is a really remarkable photo of the construction of one of the towers. This area is the elevator core. It houses the elevators and also provides a structural core. And this is the uh, exterior wall of the tower. It is also a structural element, a primary structural element. And the space between them is column free. So this is uh, an unusual framing system for a high rise a steel tower. And it came under some scrutiny after 9-11. There was a suggestion that this arrangement was uh, perhaps uh, participated somehow in the collapse of the building. To the best of my knowledge, uh, that was uh, never proven to be the case, and everything about the design, as I recall, was proven to be um, excellent. It was innovative, though. It created huge uh, floor plates, which made it a very attractive uh, space to rent. This portion is an underground concourse, and if you frequented this building, this is an area filled with uh, restaurants and shops and a tremendous amount of uh, pedestrian traffic. So it was a lively place, very prosperous, and you never had the feeling that you were deep down in a basement. Here's another slide of the old slurry wall or the existing slurry wall. 
This is a drill which has been busy installing tiebacks. So all of these uh, projections that you see coming out of the wall are uh, tiebacks or anchors. They are very long because they had to reach uh, bedrock, which is quite some distance away. There are many, many of these tiebacks. And that was the means of restraining the slurry wall. The goal was to free the inside from any obstructions, any kind of bracing, any kind of struts. So tiebacks were used exclusively to create that great big open space. And I think it's because of the appearance of this after it was excavated. It was a huge open space surrounded by four walls. And the term bathtub was immediately adopted to describe this vast open space. Post 9-11, after all of the material was removed, the uh, bathtub was apparent again, and the term bathtub came right back into popular use. And I think at this point everybody knows about the bathtub around the uh, World Trade Center site, and many people know it is a slurry wall. But beyond that, slurry walls are not very well understood, and I hope to be able to uh, clarify that for you in the next slides. I just want to acknowledge that these photos came from the Museum of the City of New York and they're dated 1967. This is a current photo. This was taken around uh, January 2007. It shows the Westerly's slurry wall. This is the same wall that appeared in that photo from 40 years ago. There have been some changes. These are tiebacks and they are new. When the original slurry wall was put in service, that is to say as the buildings were constructed, the tiebacks were de-stressed and therefore when the site had to be re-excavated post 9-11 new tiebacks had to be installed. So the tiebacks you're looking at here are new. Of course you're not seeing the tiebacks, you're just seeing the very end of the tieback. Also the wall has been coated with a shotcrete or gunite as a protective coating. The surface of the wall was uh, quite deteriorated I don't know if that's the re result of uh, being in service for 40 years or if it was the result of the 9-11 event. But it required some immediate attention and so the entire wall has been coated with this uh, shotcrete application. Now a part of the wall is to be left open to the public as part of the memorial installation so that you will be able to uh, walk down and look at the existing wall. Of course now you and I know that it's not exactly the existing wall. It has the surface modifications, the new tiebacks and the new shotcrete. Some other interesting features in this photo. This is a column for the Freedom Tower, but it's uh, somewhat ceremonial because the column was erected about the beginning of 2007 and there has been a lot of progress on the foundation for the Freedom Tower but the superstructure has not yet started. So a year and a half later we are still waiting for a start date for the superstructure. There was an area of the existing slurry wall that was not shot creeded over. And you can see its condition post 9-11. There's a great deal of exposed rebar. So surface has been lost either over time or as a result of the 9-11 event. But I wanted to share with you what the condition was after the site was re-excavated.
what is a slurry wall and how do you build a slurry wall? I'm going to go back here to some definitions. First of all, the wall we are looking at in the photos and the walls we generally refer to when we use the expression slurry walls are not slurry walls at all. They are diaphragm walls. That structural reinforced concrete wall is a diaphragm wall. It's constructed using a bentonite slurry process, but the term slurry wall is a kind of a slang abbreviation, but it's stuck and the whole world uses it and there's no reason why you should not be using it. How do you build a slurry wall? Well, you know that uh, if you excavate a trench to uh, any depth at all, the sides of the trench will begin to collapse and fall in. It was discovered that by introducing a bentonite slurry, the slurry, the hydrostatic head of the slurry, was sufficient to keep the sides open. This was a remarkable discovery and permitted very, very deep excavations. Now to begin with, what is bentonite? Bentonite is a naturally occurring clay. You mix it with water to form a slurry and you keep the trench filled with this slurry. Now I always imagine that bentonite slurry must be some very, very thick, heavy, uh, viscous material and that's what keeps the trench open. Well that's not the case at all. It's actually not much different than water in its appearance. But the bentonite has a quality of lining the surface and creating almost a membrane. So the, the bentonite coats the surface of the excavation as you go down and it, it seals the surface so that you, you continuously fill this trench with the bentonite slurry and it stays there. It does not get absorbed by the uh, soil surrounding the trench and that hydrostatic head is sufficient uh, together with this, this uh, mysterious uh, lining coating quality of the bentonite that keeps the sides from collapsing and you can go down very very deep. I have gone down over 100 feet. I've been on a project where they went down over 200 feet. At the World Trade Center that slurry wall is I believe around 60 feet deep. Now that's the slurry process, the bentonite slurry process and that's how this gets done. And I just mentioned a little aside, you can also drill shafts and you can keep the sides of the shafts from collapsing or you can drill horizontally and keep that hole from collapsing all by introducing a bentonite slurry. So there are wide applications for bentonite because of its unusual properties. Now after you've completed the excavation, you lower a cage of rebar into the trench. And that in itself is quite a challenge because you have assembled this rebar cage horizontally. You now have to pick it up, rotate it in the air, and lower it. It's a very unstable, very flexible cage and it takes a little bit of trial and error until you finally figure out exactly how to do this, turn it in midair, and lower it vertically in place. After that you fill the trench with concrete and the concrete displaces the slurry. You actually have to capture that. You wind up with a very, very strong reinforced concrete wall, which is called a diaphragm wall. So you begin with bentonite slurry, you end up with a diaphragm wall, and that has been kind of abbreviated into the expression slurry wall. We're now going to see a video. I was able to uh, capture all the different uh, techniques and two different styles of uh, digging equipment to construct a slurry wall.